I'm in between all that. So why are you awake? I don't know. I couldn't sleep. I woke up at like 1.30 and I was like, oh, it's gone. I, guess. I was planning on just coming to make up having a coffee and some food and going to work. Well, I think maybe we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. So we, um, me, Stacy, Heather, Kate, and Madeline had this wonderful opportunity to go to a pediatric integrative conference in April. Um, it was housed in Como Zoo Conservatory. So we got to see animals during our breaks. We had amazing food. We got to practice massage on one another. It was just a really amazing, amazing time. So, and just we wanted to pass on some of the information we learned to you so that you can utilize it in your care of our patients. And you get CEs out of it and paid for it. Um, so I have just kind of an overview and my colleagues will del delve a little bit deeper into it. So my learning uh, objectives, be able to list how nurses are accountable when utilizing complementary nursing, be able to define holistic and integrative nursing, um, and that's kind of a trick question, um, and then be able to list at least four complementary nursing alternatives to medications when managing pain and anxiety. So some definitions, holistic nursing, a nurse who recognizes and integrates body, mind, spirit, environment, principles, and modalities in daily life and clinical practice, created a caring, healing space within herself or himself that allows the nurse to be an instrument of healing. Um, so some holistic things that you might already be doing. Um, if your patient is upset, you know, maybe singing to them, playing music for them. If it's getting to be bedtime, maybe turning down lights, creating kind of a calm environment. Or if it's time to wake up, maybe raising the shades and allowing sunlight into the room. Um, yes. So this next de definition, integrative nursing, a way of being, knowing, doing that advances the health and well-being of persons, families, and communities through caring, healing relationships. Integrative nurses use evidence to inform traditional and emerging interventions that support whole person, whole systems healing. Kind of sounds like the other one, doesn't it? <laughs> Interesting. Hold on to that. Um, Holistic nursing theories. Um, a nursing theory is a framework from which to practice the nursing process. It provides a way to interpret findings and observations, make assessments, and plan care. So we'll look at a couple nursing, nursing theorists who were not labeled as holistic per se, but when examining their ideas, certainly though, you'll find that they're classified as holistic. More on that in a moment. So some interchangeable terms in integrative care, integrative therapies, alternative therapies, complementary therapies. CAM stands for complementary alternative medicine. And medicine in the simplistic sense of the word, something that makes you feel better. Yep. <clears throat> OK, healing versus curing. When we're talking about implementing integrative medicine, we're focused more on healing rather than curing. So curing eliminates signs and symptoms of a disease, but may not alleviate the distress associated with it. Healing may occur without curing. Curing follows a predictable path, whereas healing is unpredictable and it's creative. Integrative therapies, they focus on healing. <clears throat> so as implied earlier, Integrative therapies have been around for a while. <laughs> um, due to time constraints of this CE though, I'm just gonna limit our exploration to a couple of nurse theorists. Maybe you've heard of them. The mother of nursing. Um, so ideas in 1820, <laughs> way back then, um, she knew that there was more to nursing than just giving bed baths and pills and shots. So the theory of environmental adaptation, um, place the patient in the best possible position for nature to act. There are healing properties of the physical environment. 
healing environments continued. Physical environment, unnecessary noise or noise that creates an expectation in the mind is that which hurts a patient. Such unnecessary noises undoubtedly induced or aggravated delirium in many cases. I don't know if any of you have been around me when I'm trying to get some sleep, um, but if it's noisy, I definitely get into aggravated delirium. It is not wise to bug me when I'm trying to sleep. So, um, environmental light. Second to their need for fresh air is their need for light. It's not only light, but direct sunlight. The usefulness of light in treating the disease is all important. You may notice that we actually have some natural light flowing in here, and most of the time these shades are drawn. It makes me crazy, so I like to have it open. <coughs> okay. Um, color in the environment. Little is known about the way in which we're affected by form, by color, and by light. We don't know this, that they all have an actual physical effect. People say the effect is only in the mind. It's not true. The effect is on the body too. Variety of form and brilliancy of color in the objects presented to patients are an actual means of recovery. Um, so colors and wood lifter, why? Who knows? But it is, you know, variety is the spice of life, yeah? Uh, environmental landscape, that they should be able, without raising themselves or turning in bed, to see out a window, to see the sky and the sunlight. If not the very first importance of recovery, at least very near to it. It's nice to be able to see something other than hospital environment, you know, to be able to look around and see what's going on out there rather than just your constant, really close environment. Nice to see. And then finally, air quality, the first essential to the patient without which all the rest you can do for him is nothing. Keep the air he breathes as pure as the external air. And I don't know, when I hear that keep the air he breathes as pure as the external air, it just, I don't know, I need to hear it in an Irish accent. Does anybody have an Irish? <laughs> I don't know why, it just in my head plays that way, but it just does, so. So please hear it that way. It'll make you smile. All right, so we move on to a more current theorist, Dr. Jean Watson the theory of human caring. Um, she is currently still alive, which is quite wonderful because she's amazing. Um, so some of her core principles and practices of human caring, practice of loving kindness and equanimity. Does anybody know what equanimity means? I know Miss Carol and I practice it all the time. Mental calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situation. So very, very important to have as, as nurses. Um, authentic presence, enabling a deep belief of other, patient, colleague, family, etc. So you may not necessarily believe what the other person believes, but it's important to honor that and not judge them. Cultivation of one's own spiritual practice toward wholeness of mind, body, spirit beyond ego. Being the caring, healing environment and then allowing miracles or believing in them, because they do happen. Ways to be responsive to patients and others' needs, practices self-reflection, and this is we as nurses, we practice self-reflection, journaling, prayer, meditation, artistic expression, demonstrate a willingness to explore one's own feelings, beliefs, and values for self-growth, Practice discernment in evaluating circumstances and situations versus being judgmental. And develop meaningful rituals for practicing gratitude, forgiveness, surrender, and compassion. Um, did we not just have this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Um, continued. Um, we accept self and others on a basic spiritual level as unique and worthy of our respect and caring. Everybody's different. Everybody's here for a reason. Let's all treat each other nicely. Um, transform tasks into healing interactions. A lot of times with nursing, we're very, very task oriented. You know, we have to get this care done. We have to get this done. We have to get these supplies gathered. You know, it's, it's important to be conscientious of the stress that we might be conveying to patients, just that kind of stress, they feed off of that energy. Um, demonstrate genuine interest in others. We value the intrinsic goodness of oneself and others as human beings. And we just practice from the heart center. 
kind of mentioning this before, doing therapies versus being therapies. In integrative me medicine, we focus more on being therapies. So doing therapies, again, task-oriented, med administration, procedures, range of motion, passive range of motion, things that we do to a patient. Being therapies, more of states of consciousness, states of consciousness um, like maybe um, hypnosis, imagery, just thinking about a place that you might like to be, prayer, meditation, presence. Just being in a room sometimes can make somebody feel better. Intention, what do you want for your patient? Do you want them to feel good? If you put that energy out there, oftentimes they'll feel good. That presence is absolutely huge for me when training. It's not just about the tasks, it's about taking care of the whole kid. Okay, so some complementary nursing alternatives. Breathing as a relaxation technique, imagery and hypnosis, aromatherapy, massage, music, pet therapy, yoga. Um, you know, talking about all of this, who is accountable for, for integrating all of this stuff? Well, we are, but we have to um, practice within our license. So we can do things like massage, but we can't really do acupuncture because it requires a master's degree and licensing within the state. So just practice within your skill set. And the handout that I handed out will kind of outline that for you. So our focus today, just because it's such a broad, broad topic, we had to kind of rein it down a little bit. So Miss Kate very shortly will be um, introducing aromatherapy to you. And we have relaxation techniques and massage and self-care, yay. Um, does anybody have any questions? No. Well, I may then just transfer the proverbial baton to Miss Kate. So, thank you everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Kate. I am um, in the infusion department. Um, so today I wanted to focus on essential oils and aromatherapy. Before this conference, I essential oils, I knew about them, but I didn't exactly know how to use them and what exactly each one was for. After this conference, I kind of feel like I have a general base and I've gotten into it myself and using it for relaxation at home. Um, around the room, there's a couple diffusers with lavender in them, so hopefully you're all okay with that and <laughs> enjoy them. Um, but another thing that also got me into essential oils was I was realizing that a lot of my patients were using them and I would see the diffusers in the home or I'd hear a kiddo asking mom can you give me this essential oil and um, especially with my oncology clientele um, they're really using essential oils prominently in the home and in the hospital so I don't know if you've ever seen any of the kids in the hospital and um, they'll have a little cotton ball taped to their shirt and generally that has an essential oil on it that they're smelling. Um, the big one that they use in the hospital to get rid of is um, nausea or anxiety. Um, so if these can be incorporated, they really help with making the children's experience a lot better. Um, so clinical aromatherapy. The definition of clinical aromatherapy is the use of essential oils for therapeutic reasons. Um, a lot of the time, aromatherapy, people just associate that with being things that smell good. Not all aromatherapy smells good, though. There are some essential oils that are actually very strong smelling, and there are some that some people cannot take and don't like. So. Um, not all aromatherapy smells good. The term aromatherapy comes from the French chemist Get Fossey, 
and he applied lavender to a burn. He was so amazed with the healing properties of the essential oil that he spent the rest of his career actually studying essential oils and trying to figure out why they were so effective in healing. Um, essential oils have been traced back to 5,000 years. Um, in the later dates, they were more used for embalming and for cosmetic reasons. So as far as aromas and perfumes, um, nowadays they're in cleaners, they're in just about everything. There's candles and there's a huge market for them. What are essential oils? So they are mixtures of organic compounds. Um, essential oils are also botanical, are botanical extracts that come from plants. So um, essential oils can be obtained from the roots, leaves, bark, resin, fruit, or flowers of the plant. One plant may not equal one essential oil. A lot of the times, um, two different essential oils, or even three or four, can come from the same plant. Um, climate and soil can change the essential oil's quality. So if, um, depending on where the essential oil is being grown, it may not have the same variability that one that you had from a different region was grown in. So for reading the label, um, important things to look for are the common name and then the botanical name. So your common name, this is an example of lavender. So lavender is going to be your common name. And then the botanical name is Lavendula agustifolia. I probably butchered that. <laughs> but um, so there is your botanical. The part of the plant in the EO, and this label isn't perfect, it was the one that they used in the conference actually, but it had a majority of what you're looking for. Um, let's see. The, you wanna have the source of where it came from, so Tuscany, Italy. The batch and the number and then the best by use, so the expiration date. Essential oils, um, all of the ones that I've received come in a dark bottle to keep it, um, to help it last longer and you wanna make sure you store it in a cool dark place. Um, there's usually the warning on there, uh, the country of origin, which we talked about, the dilutant, and the percentage of essential oil that's in the bottle. Um, the 10 mil is usually on there. If it's a blend, there's gonna be, there should be, it should list out how much essential oil is in the blend. So there's, I have an oil that's peace and calming. It's lavender and it's a mixture of other things. It should tell you how much percentage of each essential oil is in that blend. Um, some do not though because they consider that if it's a special blend they won't give that information away because technically it would give away their product so they are not always listed. Um, other terms that a lot of labels will use are certified therapeutic grade or pure. These don't really mean anything they're just kind of fluffers to catch your eye. Really there is no standard as far as if it's certified, therapeutic, or pure. So just something to be aware of. Essential oils can be administered topically, orally, inhaled, vaginally, or rectally. Now the vaginally and rectally are um, typically not prominent here in the US. So <laughs> it's, it's usually in other countries where you'd see this. In the US, the most common routes are inhalation and topically. Right now, we're diffusing them and inhaling them. Um, when you apply essential oils topically, you wanna make sure that they are diluted. The only one that is really safe to go directly on the skin is lavender. Um, topical essential oils and their dilution. So for an adult, um, your carrier would 
be your carrier lotion. So you'd put the essential oil drops into a lotion to create your mixture. You want the percent to be one to five percent. For pediatric, one drop of essential oil mixed with five mils carrier lotion is one percent solution. Um, two drops of essential oil mixed with five mils carrier lotion would be two percent. And then for peds, it's one drop essential oil mixed with 10 mils carrier lotion is 5% solution. Um, reasons for dilution are they decrease the irritation and increase the area of distribution. For kids, their skin is more permeable. Kids and essential oils. So. Um, Kids really have scent preferences that they've built up, so just because it is a scent that you may like does not mean that they may like it. Um, they typically gravitate to things that they know, so smells that they're familiar with versus smells that are, I'm trying to think of one. Um, there's like thieves, the stronger smelling ones are just overpowering for kids. It's better to start them off with the gentler calming smells. Um, so the scents that this conference had recommended or that Children's uses at their hospital are true lavender, sweet orange, peppermint, lemon, and spearmint. So we'll talk about each of them. It's also fun for kids to kind of get to pick their own essential oil so they can kind of have a say in it. So if they, um, if you give them options, it's kind of fun to say, okay, this one will help you with nausea. Which one would you like to use? Um, so the reason that they picked these essential oils are they're all gentle, pleasant smelling, and cover key symptoms of pain, anxiety, nausea, and insomnia. Um, so for sweet orange, it's known as the child's remedy, um, and that's because in France it covers such a broad spectrum and is very gentle smelling. Um, it covers uh, digestive complaints, anxiety, it's good for skin care, and it's a good essential oil to start kids with. For lemon, um, it's antimicrobial, which is why it's in a lot of cleaners. It's uplifting and counteracts drowsiness. But um, a warning with lemon is that it's phototoxic. So if it's applied to the skin, it can increase your risk of sunburn. Um, it's also good for nausea. For lavender, um, the type of lavender that you want to use is true lavender if you're looking for relaxation. Um, with respiratory symptoms, you can use spike lavender, and they sound very, sim the botanical name sounds very similar, so you want to be careful not to use spike lavender when you're trying to use true. Um, it's the most accessible of the essential oils, and it's the oil to have if you don't have any and you're looking to get one, lavender is the best one to start with. It's, um, it has a very calming nature and it's very gentle, so if you are looking to get into essential oils, that's a good place to start. It's good for skin conditions, as I said in the beginning, um, Gustafi, or Get Fossey used it to help um, clear up his burn that he had. Uh, pain, anxiety, and premenstrual symptoms um, are also things that lavender helps with, and it can be used undiluted. For peppermint, which is one that I accidentally put in these before, so you might have gotten a whiff of that, it is a little stronger. Um, and out of Peppermint and spearmint. Spearmint is the one that kids usually like because it's not as strong as peppermint. But for peppermint, it's an analgesic. It helps with digestive problems, um, fatigue, it's a decongestant, and it helps with headaches, pain, and nausea. Um, I personally suffer from migraines, and I, um, when I was younger, someone actually 
had told me to use peppermint and I started applying it to my temples and it actually does provide some relief. It doesn't help it all the way, but <laughs> it, um, it definitely knocks out a lot of that pain for me. So it's something I use at home on myself. Um, for spearmint, it helps with digestive problems. Um, it's a lighter smell than peppermint, as I was saying before. Uh, it helps with fatigue. It's a decongestant. Um, it also helps with acne and nausea. Important considerations with essential oils. Um, you want to look at the condition that's being treated. Different, um, so there are studies that were done with essential oils that it depends on how you look at the facts of it and the study group, but there are certain ones that can be tied to seizure disorders and possibly it's, so what I mean by the research is the kiddo who had a seizure had already had a seizure history, so it may have sparked a seizure from the strong smell. Um, so you want to look at what their uses are for, what their warnings are before using them, especially with medically complex kids. Um, you want to look at the patient characteristics um, and the properties of the essential oils, the professional practice parameters, um, the safety data, and then the patient preferences. With all of the essential oils and using them in this um, instance you would want to discuss it with a doctor before incorporating any of them and would essentially need an order. Um, for safety concerns, uh, there's toxicity from accidental ingestion, which um, a lot of the essential oil vials have little cappers on them that only or little droppers on the top. But if a kiddo was to get that off and ingest the whole bottle, they can be very harmful. So you want to make sure that they're in. Treat them like medications. Make sure they're up and tucked away and out of reach of kids. Um, they can cause allergic reactions. Some of the essential oils do have that phototoxicity with them. Um, and then there are potential drug interactions. And that's all. Any questions? There was a lot to cover from the conference as far as um, what they went over, but if you have any questions. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that'll work too. Okay. Oops. I'm just going to hold it. I think I'm going to cover it. Um, I don't know if you guys know me. I'm Madeline and I'm a case manager here at PHS. Um, and so I went to the same conference, obviously. Um, I know we're kind of whirlwinding through everything because you have to think this was a two-day conference and we're trying to pack all the content into an hour. <laughs> so we're just giving you the gloss over, but if you have any extra questions, we're happy to answer and um, yeah, go into more detail. Um, I am going to talk about just a couple of relaxation techniques that we learned at the conference. Um, two, the two that I'm going to go over, one is guided imagery, um, which you might be familiar with. Oh, thanks. It was like falling underneath my shirt. Thanks. Um, so one was guided imagery. You're probably familiar with that. The other one is abdominal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. Has anybody heard of that before? Has anybody learned it before or like practiced it before? Seeing some nodding. So that's good. Um, I'm going to go over that a little bit more because it's a very easy way to bring yourself down, to calm yourself down and you don't need anything except your lungs. So 
Those should always be with you. Um, so yeah, relaxation techniques. Um, the learning objectives, I'll just read them off for you quick here. You're going to know how to identify how the body responds to stress and the role of relaxation techniques in that. And then hopefully you'll also learn how to demonstrate, or you'll be able to demonstrate how to teach a child or family member diaphragmatic breathing. Because as nurses, we have a wonderful opportunity to be the teachers. We should, of course, practice these in our own lives, but then we can also, you know, the main reason for this conference is so we can bring this to our patients and help them um, deal with everything they have going on as well. So, um, I already talked about this. Those are the two topics. So, first, I just wanted to go into the opposite of relaxation, which is stress. Um, this is what we are trying to avoid and what we are trying to work around. So stress is kind of what we have when we feel like we're in danger. It'll elicit this adrenaline rush and we feel like there's something wrong and it has all kind of negative consequences on our body. Um, relaxation is the opposite of that or you can almost think of it as the, um, the when stress is not present. So. Um, I put a fight or flight in there and rest and digest because I have a video for you and that's how he refers to them. Um, I think he's coming up next. This is a guy, he teaches pharmacology lectures online on YouTube. I used to watch him in nursing school and his name is Dr. Farmer and he's going to go a little bit more into stress and relaxation and how that actually operates in the body and what systems are at play. So, there he is. Uh, well, uh, here he is. Uh, my representation of the sympathetic nervous system uh, right here. Uh, this gentleman is running away from that woolly mammoth. Uh, and so he is our uh, sympathetic nervous system mascot. Uh, you guys might know the sympathetic nervous system response is the adrenaline rush. Uh, if you've ever had uh, fear or anger or stress, uh, and feel your heart beating and your blood pressure go up, that's your sympathetic nervous system at work. And of course, this is the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. So this gentleman right here, he is our symbol for the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which is like the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. Please do not get parasympathetic confused with sympathetic. Uh, they pretty much have opposite effects on organs. Uh, and so the parasympathetic nervous system, we're going to call that the rest and digest system. Uh, parasympathetic nervous system uh, is to help us relax, uh, repair, uh, and renew and digest. Uh, it's pretty obvious uh, that we get way too much of this uh, and not enough of this. All right, so let's talk about this autonomic nervous system. Autonomic just means automatic. You do not control your automatic nervous system. You do not control your autonomic nervous system. It works automatically. So what's going on uh, with this dude? Well, his heart is pounding. Uh, and that is the effect of the sympathetic nervous system, especially the effect of adrenaline, uh, also called epinephrine. His blood pressure is sky high. Uh, when you're sitting around relaxing, your blood pressure uh, should be normal. And we'll talk about normal blood pressure next time. Uh, but when you're being chased, uh, by a woolly mammoth that's trying to stomp on you, uh, I can assure you, your blood pressure is sky hot. Well, his lung airways are open. They're wide open uh, because he needs the increased ventilation uh, due to the increased metabolism uh, of his muscles working so that he can survive. So, those are my video editing skills. It's about as good as it gets. Um, so that was just to really kind of hone in. This is our body has response to stress and in these really real ways, measurable ways, your heart rate will go up. Blood pressure, you might, your respirations will go up. We've seen this all with our patients, I'm sure as well. If they're stressed out or doing what, you know, those, you can see those effects. Um, so he talked about how the autonomic nervous system is automatic. We have no control over it. And that is generally true. You know, we can't control our blood pressure. That would be awesome if we could, but we can't. Um, but they have found that there, so we can control one aspect of all of these things, which is our respiratory rate. Um, 
and how we breathe, that's something we can do intentionally, and it actually has an effect then on the rest of those systems. So if you learn to breathe pro properly or in a certain way, um, you will notice that your heart rate will also follow and come down. Um, your muscles actually will relax. So there's effects that kind of domino from that. So that's a very cool thing to know that, you know, if, you, if you're feeling all of this stress and there's all this stuff going on, if you start to focus on your breathing and breathe the right way, um, the rest of your body can kind of follow and help bring you back down from that. Um, some other names for diaphragmatic breathing you'll have heard is one is deep breathing, abdominal breathing, balloon breathing, choir breathing, I've never heard that, but, um, and then yoga breathing. So we are going to learn how to breathe that way. Um, and I'm teaching you so you can teach your patients. And we'll go over that in a little bit. But one thing you can do um, to start off, I think it's easy if you put one hand on your chest and then put another hand on your stomach and then just kind of breathe and notice what's happening, how you're breathing. Um, try to feel which hand is moving more. Maybe both hands are moving. Maybe the chest hand is moving or maybe just your stomach hand. So just pay attention to that. Um, the goal is when you're practicing this, you can do it laying down, sitting up or whatever, but you want your chest hand to pretty much not be moving and your belly hand will be going in and out <laughs> while you're breathing. And for a lot of people that's really unnatural. We tend to breathe with our chests, which is also kind of the hyperventilation stressful way to breathe. When you think of hyperventilating, you're taking short shallow breaths up through your chest. So. Um, try to just be mindful of that while you're sitting here with your hands and um, move. It, you just have to practice it and move in such a way that eventually your stomach hand will start to move. Um, and some tips on that are um, we instruct people then to try inhaling air through your nose. So try that right now. Um, air should be filling deep into your lungs, allowing your diaphragm to contract, which means move downward. And then you want to exhale out your mouth, um, which at that point your diaphragm is relaxing. Um, exhalation should be longer than inhalation for this, so just try to think of that as you're going through this as well. Um, one thing that can help too is if you think of an image of a sleeping adult, um, their stomachs often will be the, one, you know, the part moving, or else a baby, they kind of do this naturally because they don't have stress yet. <laughs> at least not when they're, when they're not crying, I should say. I'm sure they do have stress. but. Just try to think of that image too. Um, and then this is something that you just practice and you can bring it to wherever you are. After this conference, I was driving the next morning, it was like super all this traffic. And I was practicing it and it was working. And it was so funny because then we all talked amongst ourselves and like th two or three other people were doing the same thing <laughs> in traffic that morning. And it really did help. It's just, you know, you can feel the calming effects. But it does take time and practice. So um, be aware of that. So we um, primarily deal with pediatrics. So some special considerations or I guess tips on teaching children this. It's not the same, obviously, as an adult. Some things you can do, um, one is poke fun at the fact that you're teaching them how to breathe, which is something they already know how to do. They might think that's kind of funny um, that you have a way to teach them something that they think they already know how to do. Um, the other thing, if the kid has anxiety over something and you're about to do something stressful like a needle poke or whatever, um, that's some good incentive, you know, if you can explain to them, this will help you, you know, feel less pain, it will help you relax, they might have some incentive then with that. Um, another thing, if the kid's into sports, you might talk about how this can help you perform better, you know, if you know how to breathe right, your whole body's going to perform better. And then another thing to keep in mind is they really like props. I guess at children's, at all these hospitals now, not all of them, but um, a chunk of them, they have stuff on the floor like pinwheels or bubbles that they use. They have like a holistic health cart or whatever they call it. And they can grab these things and use them as tools with their patients to teach them how to breathe or whatever they're trying to teach them, which is very cool. Um, but in the home, you might not have that. So you can even use like a Kleenex or a feather. You can, you know, they're breathing and watch the feather blow or whatever. They might think that's kind of fun. A last thing you might want to try is putting an animal, stuffed animal or something on their stomach and they can watch it go up and down, which they might think is funny and fun and make them more interested um, in the topic. So that's breathing. Does anyone have any 
quick questions about that or I'll go on to the other topic. That one's just a great one because it's pretty universal. You can do it whenever you want and teach it whenever you want. Um, guided imagery is the next one I'm going to go into and that's, this is a little more, I don't know, it takes more, which you'll find, um, but it's also a wonderful tool. So if you can use it, you should because it, it's really effective. Um, and actually how effective it is, hopefully, if I do this right. So I'm a novice, so bear with me. So what we'll do is you're all sitting down, so that's good, but just try to find a comfortable position in your chair. Um, just whatever is most relaxing to you, do that. And then whenever you feel like it, you can go ahead and close your eyes. Um, and just take a few of those breaths we were talking about, deep breaths, and um, focus on your breathing. Breathing in and breathing out. Just do that a couple times. So once you settle in, notice your body. How does it feel? Let your body begin to relax by releasing the areas of tension by breathing. Good. Take a slow, deep breath, and as you exhale, let the tension go. Feel your body relaxing as you breathe out. Allow your breathing to gradually slow down. Breathe in and out. As you do this, allow yourself to picture in your mind a safe place. Or maybe you're already there. What's the first place that comes to mind? What type of place does your mind choose as a safe place? Maybe you're in a beautiful garden, or in the mountains, or in an open field or beach. Picture a place that feels calm, safe, and serene. A place you feel safe and protected. Notice how well you're doing. What smells do you notice? Is it sweet, pungent, refreshing? Are there birds overhead, or is it quiet? What other sounds do you hear? Let these sounds lull you peacefully. Breathe in and breathe out. After you've been here at your safe place and you are ready to leave, allow yourself to come back into the room and leave your safe place for now, knowing you can return to your safe place at any time you like. Open your eyes, but stay in a relaxed position, taking a moment to reawaken completely. Continue to breathe smoothly and rhythmically. Take a few moments to experience and enjoy your relaxing meditation. Your safe place is available to you whenever you need to go there. So for that one, I used a script um, because I'm not a professional <laughs> person and I wanted to make sure I said the right stuff, but you don't have to have a script. You basically can, you know, I'm going to teach you actually how you can do it without a script. So um, did you guys feel relaxed? Did it work? Okay, good. So that's just, you know, you've got to feel for what kind of effect this has on people. It's pretty cool because they've done studies and um, apparently if you imagine a place, your brain responds the same way as if you are actually at that place. So think, keep that in mind. You can kind of go on vacation whenever you want, which is very cool. I would love that, yeah. So um, I'm just going to go through kind of what I did there and how you can duplicate it. Um, induction is the first phase. Um, 
they talked at the conference a lot about like, you know, you can have your patient gaze at a corner of a wall or just find something to focus on and just gaze off at it and focus on their breathing for a while. And you know, if you have a lot of time with them, you can just do this for a while, get them nice and relaxed before you go into it. Um, like I said, concentrate on breathing. One thing, you know, if a kid is not interested, you can just say something like, oh, I know a cool way to help you relax and feel better. Do you want to try it? All you have to do is think about a favorite place. And then they might, um, they might get interested. If they're not, they're not, but it, it's worth a try. Um, another, then you just start to talk. I mean, the favorite place is an easy one. That's pretty much what they focused on at the conference. So I think if I went to do this, that's what I would choose is just a favorite place, a safe place. You know, just think of somewhere you like to be. And um, then just start to talk about it and describe it. And you want to really keep it open, as open as possible, because you don't want them to get a conflict in their mind. Like if you say, you know, you know, you're in your safe place and now, you know, and now there's sand on the beach and they're not picturing sand on a beach, that's confusing. So just keep it as open as possible. Um, language should be permissive. So a lot of either or, you know, maybe you smell, maybe you can hear the water, but maybe you can't, you know, or maybe, maybe it's hot out, but it, maybe it's cold. However the air feels to you, just notice that. So keep it open for them so they can think of what they want to think about. And then another thing to keep in mind is um, inserting positivity and praise in there is really helpful. So just saying, good, you know, you're doing a great job, or notice how well you're doing. Notice how, how relaxing this is making you feel. Good job. Those things um, are good to have in there. So with kids, with an adult, that's probably pretty easy to just do this with your significant other. But if you're with a patient, you really got to take into consideration their developmental stage. Um, this might not work for a toddler, for example. They might get distracted, maybe limited, yeah, but just keep that in mind. You guys are the best judge of how you, th you know, knowing your patient and where they're at and whether you think they'd respond to this. Um, for the little kids, the breathing is a great thing you can do with most ages, but this one takes a little bit more cognitive ability. Um, then another thing to keep in mind is kids don't always close their eyes, I guess, for this. So most, some of them just are more comfortable keeping their eyes open, and it's not bad. They can reach the same place with their eyes open, so it's, don't think that they have to close their eyes. And then another thing, um, this doesn't have to be this huge long session. That wasn't long, by the way. You can do this for a very long time. But it can just be, you know, if someone's in the middle of something as a distraction, just be like, you know, let's talk about, tell me about the cabin, how, you know, and then just get them to think about it and focus on it. And then they um, will kind of get some of those effects from the guided imagery. So that's it. Does anyone have questions about it? Okay. Cool. Thank you, guys. Clip on here. All right, sweet. Maybe. Put a user malfunction here. All right. Oops, I forgot my baby. One second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello everyone, I think I know pretty much every, mostly everyone in here. I'm Stacy. I'm one of the case managers. I've been around here for a while. Um, so I'm gonna talk about massage. Um, that was one of our topics um, at the conference. So just a few things. We'll talk about several benefits of massage. I'm sure all of you are pretty aware of what many of them are, but especially in consideration of our patients. And then demonstrate a couple common massage techniques. Um, I'm completely aware that it's probably outside of a lot of people's comfort levels to massage each other. <laughs> so when I do some demonstrations, I'm gonna show some things on the baby here, um, and then we'll practice a couple like things that you can maybe do like on yourself. So, All right, 
So why massage? I'm sure most of you can probably speak to this. It is probably one of the best, at least in my opinion, um, non-drug strategies out there for pain control and relaxation. Um, I think it's awesome. Um, so um, the fight or flight, um, which was talked about a little bit uh, earlier, um, kind of some of those signs with that parasympathetic response. So you've got your increased heart rate when you're stressed out. You breathe fast and shallow. Like, I don't like public presenting, so I'm a little nervous right now, so I'm probably breathing fast and shallow. <laughs> um, chest pain, dry mouth, your digestion slows down or stops. Blood pressure can go up. Um, muscles can tense up and you just, any of you that maybe are sitting, like I know nursing school, especially you're stressed out and you're sitting, you're hunched over a book, which doesn't help your posture and muscles as well, but you're stressed out so you feel all of that, like in back and neck, that type of thing. So, <laughs> why massage? I know, am I great? Um, triggers a relaxation response. Those of you in this room who have had massages before, whether you go in and get one done or have someone do one for you or you even just kind of maybe rub your shoulders a little bit, I think it just instantly lends itself to relaxation. Um, virtually there are no negative side effects at all. So that was something that I thought was really neat to know. Uh, really help diminishes the pain cycle. Might not completely take the pain away, but I think it really helps. Um, your response to pain can be decreased. And really your perception of pain, which I think is, is huge too um, as well, um, can really reduce your anxiety, um, nausea, um, agitation, stress. And then overall, as anyone in this room can probably agree with, really helps with relaxation and comfort. Also can really help with digestive issues, and I'm gonna show a technique for that a little later too. Um, so it can help those patients. Like we work with a lot of patients that have tons of GI issues, constipation, gas pains. Um, so it can definitely help with that. So it's really like your manual morphine. All right. Um, so there was a quality improvement project because we're all about evidence-based practice in nursing um, that they talked about at the conference. And so this was done over an eight week period, um, about 90 mm -hmm. sessions with patients. They use the um, numeric and the flax scales to uh, monitor the pain. And pain was headache, abdominal, um, patients with sickle cell disease, um, post-op pain, which can be pretty pretty bad, um, low back, and then ulcerative colitis. Um, and really consistently across the board when utilizing massage with these patients in this study, um, there was a very consistent reduction in pain. Um, Really, it was less than 5% reported that they had no change in pain, and those were those that had chronic pain conditions. So it really, like I think, shows you that it can be very beneficial, especially with those acute episodes of pain. All right, so pediatric massage. Um, so we all work with our peds patients here in the room. So there's many ways that you could, I can see just looking at this list, that you could incorporate this in your practice with your patients. Um, pain, and this can be our patients, patients with chronic pain, this can be useful for, and then maybe for an acute procedure like an IV insertion is up there. Um, are they having anxiety? Um, our patients have anxiety about many things. We have patients who, let's say they're going to college and they're worried about a test, um, or anxious for unknown reasons, can be beneficial there. Um, nausea, the constipation and gas pains, muscle tension, headache, cancer care, pre or post-op, um, it's helped get them to walk. It can be a motivator for that, or if you're in a lengthy hospitalization um, as well, so that can be another indication for massage. Um, something to think about as well is like making sure you're tailoring the treatment for your patient, um, because definitely there might be some contraindications where you might have to kind of adapt how you're massaging or where you're massaging. Um, so I think some are, are um, obvious, like if a patient has open wound sores, lesions, et cetera, like you're not gonna massage on those areas, but maybe if you're massaging in a different location that can still help them. Um, swollen lymph nodes, edema. Um, if a patient's on blood thinners, that's just something to think about too. Um, DVT, um, if they're febrile. So just considerations, look at the whole picture as well before you kind of jump on into it. 
So there are many simple massage techniques out there. Um, so these are the ones I'm just gonna kind of briefly cover. So these are all considered like Swedish massage techniques. Um, when they talk to us about in the conference is they don't recommend doing deep tissue massage. It's not something we would do with our patients in our homes. Um, could potentially cause harm. Um, and actually that releases a lot of toxins if you're doing a true deep tissue massage, um, if any of you are familiar with that too. So this is all Swedish massage. So, so the first one we'll talk about is compression. Um, and it's kind of what it sounds like. And like really when you're starting a massage technique, you're kind of starting from like, usually the compression comfort holds and then you're kind of gradually easing into the rest of it. So say you got your baby here and your um, compression. So you're doing your kind of just like rhythmic probably show a turnaround so you guys can see pressing into the muscle tissue and that's just gentle and really adapt it um, to the kids you're working with um, after this conference I um, did this with I have an eight-year-old and a two-year-old and so I had tried it with my son who tolerated it pretty well and then my daughter it was like I mean I barely touched her say mama stop you know so I had to be really conscious of that so adapt it to your kids so for her just like a really light touch was all she really needed for that. Um, and that just helps increase your blood circulation. Comfort hold is literally as it sounds, is you're literally like, let's say your child's down here and you're just holding like that. So I don't know if you guys can see, but I'm just holding, and that's literally just what it is, comfort hold. You're just kind of holding that nice static hold. And it, it's amazing how relaxing that is. We practiced. Um, massage techniques on each other during this session and it was just so relaxing to have those comfort holds in there. So the gliding, and I'm gonna butcher this name, effleurage, I'll call it gliding, is probably the most popular, and probably the one that you're the most familiar with. Um, and it's just those superficial or maybe even slightly deeper strokes that you can use. So I think it's what's kind of more commonly associated with massage. And then um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but with the Swedish massage, you're kind of more like going towards the heart basically is what you're, what the goal is. So I mean, it's really like that kind of just light gliding like that. If anyone wants to demonstrate on each other, feel free, but I know it's something that's not the most comfortable if you're not friends with everyone. Um, and really the slower your strokes, the more relaxing the experience can be. Um, but sometimes there might be situations where doing something that's faster or more stimulating is what you're trying to do too. So that's kind of another thing to think about as well. Um, so petrissage or kneading is kitty paws. I know it's like cute. <laughs> Um, and that's exactly what it is. So like, you know, that kneading, well, I have cats that knead on me when they want to eat in the morning. So that's <laughs> pretty much what, um, what that is. So it's literally kitty paws. Um, it helps move fluid and kind of break up those adhesions that you can sometimes get. And if you're doing massage on these patients, you can definitely feel where that is. But I mean, really, it's just like that kneading type motion. That's literally what that is. So think kitty paws. Then percussion and tapotement um, is kind of like that tapping. I think like sometimes you see maybe sometimes like that karate. It's not really kind of like that, but it can be kind of like that tapping like this. I don't know if you guys can see. Um, and then they do talk about the cupping, which is really like those manual BDs that I think some of you in this room do with your patients. And that also is another massage technique. So that, I want to do that, is also another one that you can do. And it helps break up your lung congestion as well. All right, and then rocking. This one I had a really hard time with, <laughs> um, and it wasn't quite honestly my favorite, but it's definitely one that can be very soothing and relaxing. It can help um, decrease muscle contractions, especially in some of those like CP or patients that are real tight. Um, and it's just kind of a push and release. So like when they had to do it, I had a really hard time with it, but I mean, you're kind of like literally like pushing and releasing and I think these guys can attest to me that it wasn't the easiest thing to get a hold of or get get the heen of so but that's definitely another technique out there too um, 
And what I will say too is you do not need to be an expert at all. I am no expert in massage whatsoever to do this, but I think even just trying to incorporate it, maybe just a few minutes here and there is definitely beneficial for your patients. Um, so demonstrations, so it's completely up to you guys if you, maybe we'll just have you guys do this. Um, so when we walked into the conference before we even started this, and maybe I should have started with this too, um, they had us just kind of sit down and relax, you guys relaxed, and then take your opposite hand and just relax and massage in some of those techniques. And you think kind of above there, you can get, kind of get the side of your neck there too. And it was interesting because we started that and I'm like, oh, I'm just massaging my own neck. This isn't a big deal. But I was surprised at how much, A, tension I could feel in my own back, but B, how, much, how relaxing it really was. So this is something that you can do easily if you're having maybe it's a busy shift, you're feeling a little stressed out, take a minute or two and just kind of relax and massage your neck. See, isn't that nice? <laughs> Um, and then hands and feet, um, I think that's another area that you might not always think of that you can do massage on. Um, some ways they kind of describe to do that um, with your patients. I mean, you can start kind of on that like forearm area by your elbow and just kind of do those gliding type motions. And again, if you have like a lotion or an oil in the home, definitely use that if that'll help you. Um, not necessary. Um, you can do that and then kind of do it on your palms and then kind of to the ends of your fingers. And again, I think that's something that you can also do for yourself. And again, I'm surprised at how relaxing that is as well. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is I mentioned a little bit earlier about the abdominal massage for our patients that have like gas or colic pains or constipation. I think constipation is a common one that comes up with our patients. So they taught us this I love you technique. Um, and so I'll explain that. Um, and really it is, it says follow the plumbing and that's completely true. Um, so what you would start with doing um, is you'd start with your ascending colon right there. And I mean lightly, just the massage. So that's the I. So starting at the bottom and going up, I. And then you're doing kind of, then it turns into an inverted L. So L, and then you're going across your transverse colon like that, love, and then down your descending colon. So I love you. Um, it was interesting because um, we were talking about doing it, some people actually practiced it on each other, and then the instructor said, yeah, pretty much when people do this, there's probably someone who usually has to go use the bathroom at some point. So <laughs> it is very effective, and you can, like with, um, with your patients, if you're doing that, I mean, if there's stool in there, you can feel it. So it does, it's been proven to be very effective. So that's something that I think would be really beneficial, and it's um, non-pharmacologic, and it's, yeah, works pretty well. So definitely check with your families though before you do that on your kiddos, but yeah. And I think that is about it. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Heidi one time called me the, the baby whisperer for putting kids to sleep. Yeah. But I didn't know I really like, like their rests, I don't know if they have restless legs or what, yeah. their legs are just kicking all over, so I just grab them and I do that, squeeze and let go, mm -hmm. and they just start relaxing, mm -hmm. and then they, they'll actually kick the other leg out, like do that one. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I do this little baby yeah. massage, and they just melt, and they fall asleep nice. in 10 minutes. It's that's just awesome. Fun. So mm -hmm. that's my secret to being a baby whisperer. <laughs> no, I completely agree with you on that. After this conference, I had gone home that night and I did a combination of like guided imagery, which Madeline took us through, and I did that massage on my son and like used some like put some lavender on a tissue <laughs> thing for him. And he was like, he has a hard time getting to sleep. He was out in 10 minutes. So this stuff, I mean, it truly works. It's evidence based, which I absolutely love. So good deal. Thanks for the comment. Anything else? I I love you on my son with constipation problems. Yeah, work like a charm. Nice. Yeah. <laughs>
podcast. And the, um, Mayo, the nurses at Mayo in the oncology unit, they said that they used the Iowa technique mm-hmm. and really help them with their kids mm-hmm. coming in after surgery and all the medications that they're on. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Thank you, guys. So I'm Heather Grace, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a field nurse here at um, PHS, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is self-care. Um, I am not proficient at PowerPoint, and my husband is, and he usually helps me in edits, so I just kind of apologize. The other thing I wanted to say is that I feel like all of us being nurses, we intuitively know about self-care, and we also practice self-care probably every day with our patients and our families. So what they did at the conference is it was kind of like a group discussion. Discussion. So what I'd like to do is give some information and then we can talk about things as a group. So, so the objectives today is we can talk about what we uh, think of as self-care and then I will give you a definition um, provided by the World Health Organization. And then we'll move into how self-care relates to integrative medicine, and particularly integrative nursing. And look at those in two areas. One would be is in our industry and profession is nursing to mind. Yes, definitely. What other ideas come to mind when you guys think of self-care? Showering. What'd you say? Showering. Yeah. Yeah. Personal hygiene is always good. Yes. Hobbies. Hobbies. I have to say, when I start thinking about self-care, I immediately go to my...